laughing Praise you when I'm grieving Praise you every season of the soul If we could see how much you're worth Your power, your might, your endless love Then surely we would never cease to praise Let everything that, everything that Everything that has breath praise the Lord Let everything that, everything that Everything that has breath praise the Lord you in the heavens, joining with the angels, praising you forever and a day. Praise you on the earth now, joining with creation, calling all the nations to your praise. If they could see how much your your power, your might, your endless love, then surely they would never cease to pray. Welcome to St. Peter's. Welcome to St. Peter's. Welcome to St. Peter's. Well, good morning, St. Peter's Church family, Eastgate and Carlton. And good morning to you if you're joining us from around the UK or around the globe. It's good to have you with us. Do use the chat feature uh, to connect with us. And if you're joining us for the first time, all that you'll need for this service will appear on the screen. And a special welcome to those who are being homeschooled during the week. In these extraordinary times, it can be really hard to stay focused, especially when you can't see your friends. Keep up the hard work. I hope you can have a rest day today. And trust God that he's working something good, even in these difficult times. It's great to be gathering around God's word and uh, with the help of God's Holy Spirit uh, we're asking God to change us and cause us to trust and obey him more and more for Jesus' sake. We continue our series in the book of James, Everyday Faith in Extraordinary Times and our theme today is about taming the tongue. On Thursday uh, we remembered the crucified and resurrected Jesus ascending to his Father's side in heaven. And it's wonderful news. And before we sing God's praises and fix our eyes on Jesus, the Ascended One, I'm going to lead us in prayer. So let's be quiet before God before we sing. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for today and we thank you 
especially as we remember Jesus' ascension to your side. We pray that you would raise our hearts and minds to fix our eyes on him and that by your spirit you would change us in heart and mind and tongue. For we ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, let's begin our service by singing God's praises. For that Martin. Jesus is indeed the one who rules everything. And yet the Bible says that from the very beginning all humans turned away from God as their king. And that means if we try and look for evidence around the world today that Jesus is indeed the one who rules everything, we'll never get the evidence we need. Instead, we need to look at Jesus' life, his death, his resurrection and ascension to know for certain that he is the one who rules everything, including us. In the knowledge of that and knowing our own shortcomings, let's return to God, our King, and bow before him in heart and mind in the confidence that Jesus Christ died for sinners. Let's confess our sins to him now. Almighty God, long-suffering and of great goodness, I confess to you, I confess with my whole heart, my neglect and forgetfulness of your commandments, my wrongdoing, thinking and speaking, the hurts I've done to others and the good I have left undone. O oh God, forgive me, for I have sinned against you, and raise me to newness of life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, let's uh, have a moment uh, to uh, drink in the goodness of God's promise of forgiveness to all those who turn and trust in him through Jesus Christ and I'll lead us in a prayer of thanksgiving. Father we believe your goodness, we receive your grace, we delight ourselves at your table O Lord and drink in your goodness to us afresh 
in Christ. Amen. Well, we're going to respond by singing again, singing a song that reminds us that the Lord is King of our broken world. And after that, we'll continue to talk to our loving Almighty God. happening on the TV news. You might be worrying about the world and wonder what will happen to you. But put your trust in God alone, is He still sitting on His mighty throne? Because the Lord is King, He's going to look after everything, everything. The Lord is King. This is his world. You might get sad and wonder why there's so much pain. Why we let the same mistakes happen over and over again. Our sinful ways will always fail, but God in his ways will prevail because the Lord is King. He's gonna look after everyone. judge in fearsome majesty. But blessed are those who find their place in the shelter of His grace. Because the Lord is King, He's gonna look after everything, everything. The Lord is King, He's gonna look after everything, every single thing in this world. Because this is His World. He rules the world. Yeah, this is his world. Father, thank you that we can come together online to worship you and listen to your word. We ask that you would change our hearts and minds and help us to live thoughtfully as your children. Please turn our grumbling into gratitude, our greed into generosity, our pride into humility, our apathy towards injustice into energy to challenge it, our self-centeredness into care for others, our disregard for the world into care for your creation and our hunger for gain in this life into trust in Jesus for eternal life. We think of the poorest and least protected countries across the world for those struggling to feed their families unless they continue to work, those at risk of abuse or violence those without access to health care or clean water, those who share their home with many others or live in refugee camps, and for men, women and children who are being trafficked and are unseen, especially at this time. Father, you care for each of your children and we ask that you would reveal their situations and bring them rescue. We pray especially for our mission partners who are still working during this crisis to bring help and healing. May we remember anew that you are a sovereign God who has all things under control. Thank you that you have already brought us rescue from sin. 
by sending your son Jesus to die in our place. You have given us his righteousness so we can enjoy a relationship with you and your Holy Spirit as your presence and power with us. May our faith grow stronger as we place our hope in Jesus our Saviour. May we reflect your heart of love in our communities and to those around the world. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Let us join together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Well, thanks for leading us in our prayers, Jane. In a moment, we're going to have a sketch, a reading and a sermon. And the theme for today is Taming the Tongue. I hope, children, you've got your resources ready. Uh, they can be seen or printed off from the church website or from Friday's uh, email bulletin. Listen out for the five key sentences as Alistair speaks. And that will help you when you meet again today in your Zoom groups. This is Alan. Alan is a horse. Alan is like all horses. He likes to run and jump and jump and run everywhere. He goes left and then right and then forward and then back and gallops all over the place. He's totally out of control and has no direction at all. Alan can't be controlled when he is like this. This is Farmer Howard. Farmer Howard needs Alan to go and do what he wants him to do. Farmer Howard asks Alan nicely. But Alan is a disobedient horse and does not come. Farmer Howard tries to guide Alan. But Alan the horse is wild and still out of control. Farmer Howard has an idea. Farmer Howard has a tiny piece of metal called a bit attached to some string. That tiny thing can't control such a huge horse, can it? Farmer Howard puts the tiny bit in Alan the horse's mouth. And with the bit in his mouth, Alan goes straight away wherever Farmer Howard leads him. That tiny bit means Alan is no longer disobedient or wild and he will now go in the direction Farmer Howard leads him. How incredible that such a small thing can control such a huge horse. James chapter 3 verses 1 to 12 Not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. If anyone is never at fault in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to keep his whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are seared by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The, st the tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of his life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and creatures of the sea are being tamed and have been tamed by man, but no man can tame the tongue. 
is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. Good morning. Our title this morning is Taming Your Tongue. And I wonder if you've ever given much thought to your tongue. I know that I haven't, and I've got much to learn. It's such a small thing, and yet it's so powerful. On the one hand, a tamed tongue can use its power to build others up. But on the other hand, an untamed tongue uses its power to destroy. So why is taming the tongue so important to James? Well, it's because James is concerned with the practical aspects of the everyday living out of the Christian life. And he knows the power of words and how can destructive they can be. Last week, we learned the difference between a dead faith and a living faith. And we saw that a faith which is genuine and alive is one which works itself out in what it does. And that was illustrated to us with the examples of Abraham and Rahab. And as James has already told us in chapter 1, verse 26, the mark of a genuine Christian with a living faith is someone who has learned to control their tongue. So in our reading this morning in chapter 3, James again turns his attention to the tongue to show us why taming it is so important to a genuine living faith. So my main thought this week is this. If you belong to Jesus, show your faith by taming your tongue. And I have four points for us. Firstly, a living faith shows a tamed tongue. And secondly, the dangers of an untamed tongue. Thirdly, that an untamed tongue is double-minded. And lastly, that a tamed tongue is faithful to Jesus. So let's look at our first point together. A living faith shows a tamed tongue. A mature Christian is someone who's learned to control what they say by mastering their tongue. And James says it's these people that should be teaching others. Look with me at verse 1. None of us should presume to become teachers of the word, because those who teach will be judged more strictly. And that's a really humbling thought, isn't it? But that's how the Lord sees it. And that's why it's so important to have faithful teachers within our churches, whether it be preaching on a Sunday, teaching our children and our young people, or leading and heading up our rooted groups. You see, to teach, we need to speak. And James tells us that we will be judged by what we say. And in verse 2, James is saying that one of the qualities we should look for in those who would teach and direct the lives of others is that they show that their faith is alive and mature because they themselves have learnt to control their tongues. They're people whose speech is faultless. They're people, in other words, who walk the talk. Our tongues are so small, aren't they? And yet they're so very powerful. And James gives us two examples of how power that is correctly directed can be used for good. And the first example he gives us is that of a horse, such a big, powerful animal. And yet the horse is directed by a tiny bit in its mouth. And we saw that in the Goulborn family video, didn't we, just a moment ago? How Farmer Howard was able to master and direct the horse by placing a tiny bit in its mouth. 
And the second example that James gives us is that of ships. Like this massive container ship in this picture, which is directed by its tiny rudder. And so in the same way as a horse and a ship are directed through the control of a tiny bit and a rudder, so we must control the words that come out of our mouths and give the right direction to our lives. If we don't control our tongue, we're like a ship without a rudder or a horse without a bit, and we can't be guided in the right direction. And that's why the mark of a mature Christian with a living faith is someone who has learnt to tame their tongue. And in my second point, James goes on to show the destructive power of an untamed tongue. You see, James knows only too well that whilst the words we use can be used for good, our natural inclination is to use them for destructive purposes. Look with me at verses 5b to 6. James starts off by using the example of a tiny spark that then turns into a forest fire. Think about the spark that comes off a tiny match when you light it. It looks so harmless, doesn't it? And yet out of control, it has huge power to destroy. I wonder if you remember the forest fires that raged at the end of last year and the beginning of this. The fires were so powerful, weren't they? The heat was so intense that they created their own wind, their own micro weather system, enabling to spread in their own direction over hundreds of miles. Can you imagine the destructive power of those forest fires? And that's the destructive power that our own tongues have when they're undirected and out of control. They cause destruction and devastation to those around us. And James shows us very clearly in verse 6 what this is like when we see what really goes on inside our mouths. He tells us that an untamed tongue is a world of evil. It literally is in its own world, with its own sphere of thinking. And because of that, it reveals what really is going on in our own hearts. Our hearts don't naturally want to submit to the way of Jesus. And we're still antagonistic to him and to his authority. We have little pockets of resistance here and there, that won't submit to his loving rule and authority. And James knows only too well from Jesus's own teaching in Matthew 15 verse 11, that it's what comes out of a person that defiles them. It makes them unclean, corrupting their whole bodies. But our tongues are with us for the whole of our lives, aren't they? Maybe we should take just a moment to stop and think about the course of our lives so far and picture in our minds the damage our tongues have done as an instrument that literally spits out sparks as we've journeyed through life. When those sparks land, they start fires which grow and grow and grow out of control. That's the destructive power of an untamed tongue. Think for a moment about how many careless and unguarded words that have caused so much pain and destruction to those around us. My own teenage years were very destructive and I remember abusing my mother so badly with the words that I said to her that she was in floods of tears. And my father came to me and said, it's funny, isn't it? how you always try and hurt the person that you love the most. I wonder how many marriages have been broken, how many families have been torn apart, how many friendships have been destroyed, how much trust has been broken. For our young people, how many tears have been shed, 
how much anxiety and self-loathing has been caused through bullying and the so-called banter that goes on in school playgrounds, in the classroom, on Facebook and within Twitter feeds. That's the destructive power of words that lie in an untamed tongue. So as the mark of a mature Christian with a living faith is someone who has learned to tame their tongue, so the mark of a dead faith is someone with an untamed tongue. And for my third point, an untamed tongue shows our double-mindedness. Look with me at verses 9 and 10. Notice the repetition that James uses to point out how double-minded we are when we use our tongues at the beginning and the middle of verses 9. With it, James says, we praise our Lord and Father, and then with it we curse human beings. Two exact opposites, praising and cursing from the tongue, but coming from the same source. We can arrive at church on a Sunday and sing praises to God with our tongue. And yet with the very next breath, when we leave, we can use it to curse our brothers and sisters. How true it is, isn't it, that people reveal who they are by what they say? Let's reflect on that for a moment. How many times we've spread gossip How many times we've spoken with a forked tongue, making a malicious remark about somebody, cracking a crude joke laced with innuendo and a wink. That's the kind of faith which is double-minded and reveals who we really are. It's a faith which is unsure if it wants to go the way of Jesus or it wants to go the way of the world. And James tells us, Brothers and sisters, this should not be. Don't be double-minded. If you belong to Jesus, show your faith by taming your tongue. And for my fourth and final point, a tamed tongue is one which is faithful to Jesus. James points us back to the source of our new life, Jesus himself. Look with me at verses 11 and 12. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? Can a fig tree bear olives? No, of course they can't. You'll never taste the sweetness of fresh water if it's mixed with salt water, because salt will ruin the sauce. You'll never pick a fig from an olive tree. In the same way, you'll never pick an orange from an apple tree. The principle that James is getting at here is that our fruit must be consistent with its source. And that's the good news for those with a living faith. That's the good news for those that want to mature and tame their tongues. We have dwelling within us the source of life itself. Jesus Christ. And James has reminded us of that in chapter 1 verse 18 when he said that God himself has chosen to give us new birth through the word of truth. And the word of truth is Jesus himself. He dwells within us through his spirit. He feeds and sustains us through his word. So how do we show that our faith is living? How do we tame our tongues? Well, we do it if we listen to Jesus, if we allow the gentle pull of his bit in our mouths to direct us, if we allow his word to be the rudder that gives direction to our lives, if we drink his sweet water from his word to us, then he will enable us to tame our tongues and give direction to our lives. So we've seen this morning how a living faith shows a tamed tongue. 
we've looked at the dangers of having an untamed tongue and the destruction that it can cause. We've seen how an untamed tongue is double-minded. And then we've seen how a tamed tongue is faithful to Jesus as the source of life. So if we really belong to Jesus, then show your faith by taming your tongue. Amen. Well, thank you very much indeed, Alistair, for preaching uh, God's word to us. I wonder what one thing you'll be doing differently this week as a result of hearing God's word. One way that we can respond is by using our tongues to pray. And as you know, we started on Thursday our 10 days of prayer. And there's still lots of time to get involved. Do join us by using the Prayer Made app to find out what our prayer focus is for that day. And join us later today at six o'clock as we pray over Zoom or at noon, Monday to Friday. And I hope families, uh, you're finding the family prayer adventure map a help in praying together as families. And then next Sunday is Pentecost and we would love to celebrate as a church family by inviting you to take our global meal challenge. Cook a meal that you love that comes from another country, draw its flag, wear its costumes if you have them and then send us a photo to be included in next Sunday's service. And please send it uh, by Wednesday of this week. And we'll pray for each country that comes in. Well, our final song is Be Thou My Vision. Let's stand, if we're able, together to sing God's praises and set our eyes on him.
Well, thanks to everyone for their contributions to the service today, putting your faith in Christ into practical action. And I hope that every one of us has been blessed by God through his ministry to us. If there's anything that you wish to pray through uh, with someone, then today's a good day to do that because we have prayer ministry after the service. And the Zoom link for that can be found in Friday's church email bulletin. Let's have a moment's quiet, bringing everything in our hearts to God. And then I'll lead us in a final prayer. Father, may the Spirit, who set the church on fire upon the day of Pentecost, bring the world alive with the love of the risen Christ and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among us and remain with us always. Amen. Well, let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Lift up.